All right. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you again, or it's good for, I guess, you to see us again. Um, welcome, welcome. We're um, in uh, number six of our seven part seminar series titled From the First Humans to Forest Fires Scientific Discoveries Spanning UC Santa Barbara's Seven Spectacular Reserves. We're so glad that you can join us again tonight. And uh, uh, we are in for just an excellent, excellent talk. And I just can't wait to, to get started. Um, my name is Marianne Whitman. I'm the executive director of the UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System. Uh, and I'm gonna get started with just a little bit of information about tonight's program, um, housekeeping, if you will. Uh, first, tonight's format will be speaker presentations with a Q&A at the end. And we'd love for you to send your questions to the speaker. And the way that you can do that is there's a Q&A button at the bottom and you can go ahead and type in your questions there and we'll have a moderated session at the end where we pass along your questions to our tonight's speaker. Second, um, tonight's seminar uh, will be recorded and uh, after this evening, it will be uploaded to the UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System YouTube site. And uh, you'll get an email follow-up from uh, this seminar with uh, directions to how to find that, including a link to the, the presentation for the evening. All right, so let's, let's get going tonight. As I mentioned, we're on the sixth of our seventh, uh, seven part series um, and virtual tour of the UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System. And again, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what the natural reserve system is and why it's so amazing. And, and again, why we're so happy for you to join us tonight. So the natural reserve system or the NRS uh, is a UC system wide initiative and it's a set. It includes a set of protected lands uh, across the state of California. There are 41 of them and each UC campus manages a handful and UC Santa Barbara manages seven. And tonight we're going to move uh, east and up into the mountains. Uh, uh, and with a, and our host tonight will be the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory. I will uh, introduce Dr. Carol Blanchett in just a minute. Uh, she's the director of, of this reserve. But what happens at our reserves? So reserves, uh, they're protected for um, uh, unique purposes, for research, for university level education and for public service. And there's so much that goes on at all of them. And tonight you're gonna to learn a little bit more about some of the research. <clears throat> the, tonight, um, the, as, as I mentioned, we've moved up, um, up north and up into the mountains to the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory. And this is part of uh, uh, two reserves that UCSB manages. Uh, the other is called the Valentine Camp Reserve. And together, these two reserves are called the Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserves. Both of these reserves have, have one director. This is Dr. Carol Blanchett. And uh, she started with the UCSB NRS about five years ago now. So we're celebrating an, an anniversary of her time. Um, and before Carol came to the NRS, uh, she has an extraordinary background and, and list of accomplishments that are really too numerous to list here. But she's, she's one of our own. She's a UCSB, she's been at UCSB since 1995. First as a postdoc and then as a research biologist. She's a community ecologist with a focus on coastal and marine ecosystems and has been really at the center of many, many projects that really bring together uh, research, education, teaching, outreach. She has a long list of publications, including a children's book. And she transitioned essentially from oceans to mountains to take this job. And we're so, so excited and so glad to have her here. She brings a wide range of skills uh, of science uh, to the interface of management and education and diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives and continues to bring grants to bring all these things together. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carol Blanchett, um, who will uh, tell you a little bit more about our reserves up in the Mammoth area and introduce our speaker, Dr. Tom Smith tonight. So thank you, everybody. And Carol. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Great. Okay, so today, um, thanks everyone for joining. Today we're gonna take a little road trip. Um, 
And who does not love a road trip in the time of COVID? You don't even have to wear a mask. So we're gonna go about 300 miles to the north um, to one of the two uh, reserves operated by UCSB uh, near the town of Mammoth Lakes in the Eastern Sierra. And here's the star for those of you familiar with this area. This is the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab, otherwise known as SNARL. And SNARL had its humble beginnings back in the 1930s. It was the US Fisheries Bureau research facilities back at this time. The station was referred to then as the Convict Creek Experiment Station. And the focus of the work, work was on the emerging trout fishery. And as we know, that trout fishery has become a huge part of the economy of this region. Uh, for those of you familiar with Snarl, this is the entire field station back in 1940. And as you can see, there's our iconic Mount Morrison in the background. Snarl became part of the UCSB Natural Reserve System in 1972. So here we are in 2020, 80 years later. Um, and since then, Snarl has really grown to become one of the largest and most productive field stations in the entire UC Natural Reserve System. Uh, for those of you familiar with Mammoth, Snarl lies on Convict Creek, which is just below Convict Lake. And it's very near to the Mammoth Yosemite Airport, as you can see here. Although the reserve itself is only 55 acres, Snarl really serves as a base camp to millions of acres of public lands in the neighboring Inyo National Forest and, and Yosemite and Sequoia Kings National Parks. The Sierra Nevada Mountains are essentially Snarl's backyard and the Great Basin and White Mountains are Snarl's front yard. So as we know, the A in Snarl stands for aquatic, but the research at Snarl is not just aquatic. There are a wide range of field sciences um, that are part of the research portfolio at Snarl. And these range from mammalogy, so studies of squirrels and chipmunks to geology. And then of course, conservation work like um, Tom is gonna talk about tonight with the frogs. So like all of the NRS sites, Snarl's facilities support education, research, and public service. Uh, Snarl has a lot of facilities that I'll talk about briefly. It has a dormitory as well as multiple other housing facilities which can support use by university classes. And it's a really popular site for these classes. It's also the home to a new program that's funded by the National Science Foundation that is um, geared towards expanding opportunities for students from diverse backgrounds to participate in the environmental and conservation sciences. As I mentioned, Snarl has a lot of facilities, probably the most in the NRS, and these facilities are on par with those of a small college campus. Um, and these include a modern uh, research laboratory, housing for classes and researchers, as well as high-speed internet. Uh, one other feature about Snarl is that sustainability really is part of the mission of Snarl. And we have seven different solar arrays, which actually meet part or the majority of the station's need for electricity. Um, the newest facility you can see here in the foreground is called the Page Center. And it's a state-of-the-art classroom and meeting space. And it's also the first zero net energy facility in the UC system. We also have some pretty unique facilities here. Probably one of the most unique is a system of nine experimental stream channels. Um, these channels were designed to serve as identical replicates of streams, and these are fed directly from Convict Creek. And over the years, researchers have used this system for studies on stream ecology, hydrology, and fisheries. Another unique facility that we operate is the Snow Science Laboratory. It's operated in partnership with CREL, which is the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, which is part of the US Army. Um, for those of you who ski at Mammoth Mountain, this facility lies uh, right near the McCoy Lodge. So next time you're up there sipping your hot chocolate, you can look out and see this facility. And it's actually transmitting real-time data and images to UCSB constantly. 
Um, snow is actually a really critical resource for the state of California and forms the majority of the water needs for the state. So snow is actually a big focus of much of the research at SNARL. Um, this research ranges from forecasts of water availability, which is done by mapping the snowpack from the aircrafts, to the design of sensing systems for vehicles to navigate in snowy and low visibility conditions. At SNARL, we're really passionate about connecting people of all ages to science. One of our signature outreach programs is our seminar series, which we host in May and where researchers give public talks on scientific topics of local interest. Um, these seminars are every Tuesday evening uh, from early May to mid-June. And uh, in a normal year, <laughs> which this is not, these events are a great way for our community to come together and we often have music, food and drinks. And so we're really looking forward to getting back to um, our normal post COVID world and inviting you all to come into Snarl for um, to participate in some of these seminars live. We also know that children are our future and investing in high quality educational experiences is really vital to sustaining our environment and our economies. Every day in May and June, a busload of kids arrives at SNARL for grade specific lessons ranging from natural history to activities in archaeology and Native American life skills. These programs often combine science and art. We have a small education staff and a large core of volunteers that help to run these programs. We host over 900 children from across Inyo and Mono counties each year for these school field trips. Um, unlike places in Santa Barbara, uh, Inyo and Mono County are pretty remote, and so they're pretty far from science centers or other places like this. So these kids really rely on SNARL. Um, these programs are all supported by donations to the reserves, and we absolutely rely on the support no matter how small. So we invite you to join our community of supporters to keep these programs going. Following this talk, you'll receive an email with links to our reserve and ways you might get involved. So please don't hesitate to reach out to either me or any of our staff if you wanna learn more. So tonight, it's my great pleasure to um, have one of my favorite creatures, the mountain yellow-legged frog, help me in. Tom completed his PhD at UCSB in 2015, and he's been working at Snarl and of course the Alpine Lakes of the Sierra for most of his career. He's now an assistant research biologist at the Earth Research Institute at UCSB, UCSB. And his research focuses on how species interactions shape freshwater communities in the Sierra Nevada lakes and ponds. Um, I would also say that in addition to Tom's accomplishments as an academic scientist, his physical stamina and endurance in accomplishing his field work is extraordinary. So for those of you who have hiked and backpacked in the High Sierra out of the Eastern Sierra, you know that these, these trailheads and these uh, hikes can be quite unforgiving. And Tom not only um, spends pretty much every day of the year from just about May to September out in the field, but he's out for a month or more, you know, weeks at a time doing this field work. Um, and, it's, and it's an incredible feat of endurance, I must say. He and his collaborator, Dr. Roland Knapp from Snarl have also formed this Mountain Lakes Research Group based at Snarl. And this group really is trying to address management challenges in the aquatic ecosystems of the Sierra using science. And I will now turn it over to Tom to tell you more. I think you're on mute, Tom. Yes, I am. Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you for that great introduction um, and, and for uh, all that you do to make Snarl work. It's, it's a vital part of our, our research in the Sierra. And, and as you mentioned, you know, Snarl itself is small, but it has an enormous backyard. And, and that backyard is, is where we work. Um, covering hundreds of miles hiking each summer for, you know, averaging 75 nights in the backcountry above 10,000 feet. Um, thing, you know, and, and 
visiting as many alpine lakes and frog populations as we can. Um, so that's tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that work that we do in the backcountry and particularly what we're doing to um, understand the decline of a frog that is endemic to the Sierra Nevada, um, to the entire range of those mountains. And uh, right now, as, as we speak, I believe they've just gotten a bit of new snow up there in the Sierra. And uh, so those frogs are hunkering down in the bottoms of those lakes or um, under the shorelines, uh, getting ready for winter as that snow begins to pile up and temperatures drop in the lakes freeze. So um, yeah, again, thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna go ahead here and uh, thank some other folks. Um, this picture you see here is a lake in Yosemite. Um, that's actually not one we study, but we're hiking past it on our way to a lake uh, where we're gonna release some frogs. These are frogs I'll, I'll talk about later that spent a winter in the zoo and um, are headed to their new home. So here we've got Carol down here um, at the bottom of the hill and her husband, we've got two folks from Yosemite, um, two of the biologists from Yosemite National Park. And this is Mark, who is one of our crew members in 2020. And I just wanna thank um, folks like these who, who help our projects work, um, as well as Roland Knapp, my co-PI on all of these projects, and Alexa Lindauer and Erica Hegeman, who are our program slash uh, lab managers slash data managers slash they, they do everything and they do it very, very well. Um, and we have a long list of collaborators um, on our academic stuff, but we also need to make a special thanks to the agencies that we work with, the Yosemite Sequoia Kings National Park, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, all of who do a lot in, in our work trying to conserve these frogs that live in the Sierra. Um, they're a huge part of that, as are San Francisco Zoo and Oakland Zoo, and you'll hear a little bit about them later. Um, so without further ado, let's get hiking and um, see where we end up. Okay, here's a word that maybe 12 months ago you weren't intimately familiar with if you weren't actually someone who studied disease, um, played board games or watched certain movies. There was a movie by this name a few years ago. Um, but by now we all know what this means. Um, basically a disease that spreads around the world um, and infects large numbers of people in many, many places. Panzoatic is the animal equivalent of a pandemic. Um, so this is a disease that spreads in many, many uh, animal species. Usually, if we're talking about one disease, they're closely related um, and spreads over a large area, um, you know, continent-wide, multiple continents, and so on. Um, if you a lot of people, however, do just use the word pandemic and, and talk about wildlife pandemics or animal pandemics, and no one really gets bent out of shape over that. But um, yeah, so we're going to talk about panzoatic tonight. Um, and it's a panzoatic that infects amphibians. It infects many species of amphibians, um, largely frogs and salamanders that live all over the world. So it is a disease that infects many species and occurs on many continents as you'll see. Um, just to put this in perspective, COVID-19 is a human pandemic that we're living through now, but there have been many pandemics throughout time, um, including various pandemics of the plague, smallpox, tuberculosis, and HIV. Um, and there are a few notable animal um, pandemics or panzoatics. H5N1 or bird flu as it's called, and Newcastle disease, which is another viral disease of birds, um, both of which can get into humans. Um, Rinderpest was a disease of cattle that caused huge economic impacts throughout the world until it was eradicated um, after about a century's worth of effort. White nose syndrome is a fungal pathogen that's infecting bats um, and is spreading around the world. Um, and lastly, I'll be talking at length about the amphibian chytrid fungus, which in many ways is the, the emblematic panzoatic um, that we have recorded with science. Um, everything about it is, it just defines the term. 
it, it affects many, many species and it is covers the entire world where amphibians occur. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the fungal panzoatic itself. Um, I'll talk about that and how it affects our frogs here in the Sierra Nevada, um, the two uh, frogs that are endemic to the Sierra. And then I'll talk about the conservation tools that we're trying to use to restore these frogs to their natural or historic abundance. <clears throat> okay, worldwide, um, amphibians are declining regardless of this ongoing panzoatic that they're experiencing. Um, as part of the sixth extinction that you may have heard about, and this is um, you know, affecting lots of the species and, and um, reducing biodiversity across the globe, um, amphibians are certainly a huge part of that, if not one of the largest parts of that loss of biodiversity. Um, for them, the causes of those declines of their species diversity and abundance are habitat destruction and environmental changes, which may include uh, climate warming or um, pollution that makes their habitats no longer viable. Um, it may be introduced species, especially predators, um, some even being other amphibians, such as bullfrogs, um, trout, and fish have been widely uh, distributed by humans around the world. Um, and they are also good predators. And you might actually argue that humans are predators because one of the other big impacts to amphibians around the world is harvesting for food and pet trade. And certainly um, that might mean that we are some of those introduced predators ourselves. Um, and lastly, for a long time, there was a category of amphibian decline causes that were lumped into what folks were just calling enigmatic. Um, it's turned out that while some of those may still be enigmatic, most of those enigmatic declines are largely being attributed to a single disease or a very small number of diseases. Um, and that single disease is uh, what we'll be talking about last night. It's a fungal pathogen in the group of fungi called the chytrids. Um, so it's often called the amphibian chytrid fungus. <clears throat> And there are many chytrids that do not infect amphibians. This is in fact the only one um, that infects vertebrates. Uh, the species name is a mouthful, as you can see there in italics. I'm just gonna call it BD. I'm not even gonna try to show off by pronouncing that. So um, BD is a fungal pathogen that was first described in 1999 after being uh, found and dissected out of some frogs at a zoo in Washington. And it causes a disease called chytridiomycosis. Um, this disease, when frogs are sick with it, um, frogs can be infected with the BD fungus, but maybe not get sick. However, when they do get sick, um, what the, the disease is, is doing is disrupting their skin function. So the fungus is living in their skin cells and as it grows, it destroys those skin cells and that interrupts what, how their skin works. You know, as the skin is falling apart, it no longer functions. And if you're an amphibian, you get you do a lot with your skin. Um, you transfer gases and fluids in and out of your skin, um, probably more so than humans do, um, being an aquatic, semi-aquatic animal. Um, and so for them, that disrupts their electrolyte balance and their gas exchange. And um, this causes them to go into cardiac arrest. And so that is usually what kills them. <clears throat> uh, for BD, uh, a lot of genetic work has been trying to tease out where, where it came from and how it's evolved and, and how much diversity there is in it. Um, that can tell us a lot about how a disease has moved around the world. Um, certainly people are trying to do the same with COVID. And um, it appears that to a large extent, there's one genetic lineage that appears on all six continents where amphibians occur. So with the exclusion of Antarctica, where no amphibians occur, um, basically one type of BD has traveled all around the world and gotten there. And there's relatively little genetic diversity within that lineage, suggesting that it's done that traveling relatively quickly and relatively recently and hasn't had time to evolve to local conditions. Um, there are a few other lineages out there, um, but they're not as widespread. Um, given the uh, 
geographic extent of BD and its ability to kill its, some of its hosts. Um, it has actually driven some species to extinction. It definitely causes populations to go extinct, local extinction, um, but it can also, um, it definitely threatens species diversity as well. So, um, and, and that extends when we lose those species or lose large abundances of amphibians, there are actually ecological consequences. And that was what my dissertation looked at was whether there were ecological consequences in the Sierra. Um, there are, but that's not the topic of this conversation today. Um, but these ecological consequences in general, um, they've been looked at in other systems in Australia and in Panama where amphibian declines are also well documented. They may include um, you know, the loss of amphibians. You lose food web links. You lose ecological processes like uh, grazing and stirring up muck in streams that other animals can eat and things like that. And so that extends and you know, interrupts the carbon cycling in those streams or lakes as well. Um, those are some of the examples. Uh, these are some gruesome pictures of dead frogs that we have taken over the years. These are all victims of BD and Petridiomycosis. <clears throat> and you can see, um, you know, actually finding a dead frog like this is, it's not lucky, but it's not a common occurrence. Often they decay before we find them. Uh, this slide here is just showing a little bit of the data that other folks have found um, showing that uh, loss of ability to regulate fluids. So on the, the left here um, is sodium, which we know is an important electrolyte. If you exercise, especially those of us who run around in the mountains, we know we need salt. Um, so I thought this was a good example. Um, and you can see there's three lines here um, and three categories. So before frogs were infected, when they were infected, and then later on in the infection. And there are control frogs, there's frogs that were sick and showing symptoms, and then frogs that weren't showing symptoms. And then on the y-axis here, um, we have the amount of sodium in their system. And you can see that for these diseased frogs, the ones that are showing sickness at the end of the experiment or the study period, they've really lost a lot of that sodium. And for the same frogs who were diseased and showing low sodium amounts, as well as other physiological changes, this is actually um, a graph of their heart function over time. And so um, this is several hours before death. This is a few hours, one hour, and then right before death. And you can see that basically the heart, the heart rate just slows and stops and disappears to be no heart function. And that is the end of a frog. And, and we've definitely witnessed that in the field. Um, this is a diagram of that distribution around the world. This is you know, if we're talking about the pandemic, this is one of the figures that, that really shows it. So the, the takeaway is that all the dots, the colored dots on this world map are different genetic lineages of BD. Um, and, and really the thing that is impressive is that the green dots appear all over the map. And so that's the, what they call the GPL or the global pandemic lineage. And it's traveled all over the world um, at least within the last 100 years, if not even a shorter time period than that. So. <clears throat> and this next figure is showing some of the large scale declines that have resulted as BD has been the world. So you've got the world map in the background, and these little bar charts are superimposed over their geography, geographic areas. On the y axis for each one, we have the number of species that are impacted. And severity here on the x-axis relates to this little key over here where we see different levels of decline uh, with blue being mild declines of less than 20% of, of the species abundance and then extinct at the other end being the entirety of a species abundance. Um, one thing to know is just that there are very different numbers of amphibians in these sy different systems around the world. So, you know, from Mesoamerica and South America and Brazil specifically, there are, those are areas with really high uh, amphibian diversity even prior to the, the Panzoatic. And so their numbers just look a lot bulkier because there were a lot more species to start with. 
Um, here in America, you know, outside of like the salamanders in Appalachia, we don't have remotely as many species of amphibians. Um, but you can see that we do have some that are in the, the moderate to severe declines and even some that are predicted to be extinct. So, and this is all driven by disease emergence of BD as it has moved around and appeared in different amphibians. <clears throat> Here in California, um, BD infects a lot of the frogs and that we have um, frogs and toads in our state, um, including Rana muscosa and Rana cirae, which are the mountain yellow-legged frogs I'll talk about, um, as well as Rana boilii and Rana draytonii, which are the foothill yellow-legged frog and the California red-legged frog, and Axorus canoris, which is the Yosemite toad. And these are all threatened and endangered species, and they all can be infected by BD. Um, it also infects some of our non-threatened species, including the Pacific chorus frog, um, the one frog that if you hear any frog in California, that's probably the frog you're hearing, as well as the bullfrog, which is a non-native species to California, but is pretty um, widespread around the state. <clears throat> uh, it's been found in uh, museum specimens from California as far back as 1915, um, as far as I'm aware of. Um, and, and a lot of declines from naturalists and scientists who were um, around California, working herpetologists, um, documented declines in amphibians a lot in the 1970s and 1990s, um, or that declines had already happened by the 1990s. Um, and subsequently, a lot of these declines have been assigned or hypothesized to be due to BD. Um, so it's actually had pretty big impacts in California, even prior to our knowledge of it. As I said, it was only defined as a species in 1999, um, and it really had done a lot of its work prior to that. And all of the BD in California, as far as I'm aware, is part of this global pandemic lineage. Um, <clears throat> okay. These are our friends here in the Sierra Nevada. These are the guys that we get up in the morning to go see. Um, these are the ones that Carol and Steve and uh, their kid were so excited to help us like, go into Yosemite this summer. These are the mountain yellow-legged frogs. They are truly an iconic animal for anyone hiking in the Sierra Nevada who's fortunate enough to see one. Um, decades ago, it was no problem. These days, it's a little harder to get to see them. Got a couple eggs here attached to this rock on the left. These are the tadpoles um, here, and this is one of the adult frogs here. Um, it's actually a complex of two species, the southern yellow-legged frog and the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, Rana muscosa and Rana sierra. Um, ecologically, they're pretty much the same, as far as we know. Haven't noticed any differences yet. And uh, even morphologically, they're almost indistinguishable, but they are genetically different. Um, this map here on the right shows where the species divide is. This is sort of right in the middle of Kings Canyon National Park. And then Rana Sierra in darker blue extends a little bit down the east side of the Sierra. Um, these are the mountains facing into the Owens Valley down towards Independence and Lone Pine. Uh, most of the northern part of the Sierra is Rana Sierra going all the way up almost to Lassen. Um, they occur here around uh, Tahoe, Yosemite, um, Northern Kings Canyon, and then we have Rana Muscosa here in Southern Kings Canyon <clears throat> and the Southern Sierra, as well as down here in this di disjunct range in the mountains in Southern California, where they're actually um, not doing as well even as they are in the Sierra. There are far fewer frogs down there. So. Um, yeah, they're uh, very unique frogs in that their tadpoles live for many years before metamorphosing into uh, small frogs. Once they reach that, that stage and bigger, um, they're still highly aquatic, so they're never far from water and they're usually in water and they can occur at really high densities. Um, you know, you might have in, in the length of a meter, which is about for most of us, give or take from the floor to your hip. Um, you might have six frogs or so in a really high density population, uh, maybe more. 
in sum. Um, and the tadpoles can occur in these massive aggregations that I have a picture of later um, that may have thousands of them in, in a couple of square meters. And they just hang out there and uh, snack all day. Um, they occupy a wide range of habitats, usually in historically were down around 5,000 feet in the foothill streams and rivers on the east, on the west side of the Sierra, um, all the way up to the highest, some of the highest lakes in the Sierra um, that are up around 12,000 feet elevation, um, and then down the other side of the Sierra as well. So in those areas, they occupy pretty much anything that's wet, meadows, streams, and lakes. Um, we usually think of them as a lake dwelling species, but um, they like streams and, and parks and meadows pretty well when we're learning. We're learning more about them all the time. So um, that said, even though they used to be widespread and abundant and dense across this range of blue blobs here on the map, um, they've lost 95% of their habitat. And they're really, um, the large populations are restricted now to just those in Yosemite and in Northern Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park and sort of just along the edges of both those areas. So the, the main reason that they've declined is due to the stocking of trout in these lakes by um, European descended settlers who were moving into California and the Sierra and wanted food while they were living out there and recreating out there. Um, and so once Frogs and fish do not get along. The fish eat the tadpoles. Um, so they're basically mutually exclusive. Um, with fish in most of those lakes, they were stocked um, pretty extensively. Hundreds and hundreds of the lakes in the Sierra were stocked. Um, that left the frogs more disjunct and fragmented um, when BD started to move in. And so BD has sort of done a pretty good job of eliminating the last few remaining populations. And, and there's very few big populations that are both disease-free and large and extant remaining in the Sierra Nevada. So um, it, it can be pretty grim from some perspectives and we try to keep hope and, and that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. BD and mountain yellow-legged frogs, it has largely the same function that I described earlier where it kills them um, in, in many circumstances, and it can cause massive mortality events. We've seen, you know, arrived at a lake to see hundreds of dead frogs lying on the shorelines or dying on the shorelines. Uh, my first week on this project back in 2004, that was what I witnessed on my very first trip when I was training on how to survey for frogs in the Sierra, um, hiked out to a lake in Sequoia and just saw dozens and dozens of dead frogs. Um, and they have struggled to uh, come back in that location still now 15 plus years later. Um, very few populations disease remain disease free. It's only about a dozen or so. Um, and those are big populations. They look really great, but every year we sort of wait for which one is going to become infected and decline. There's sort of four states that a frog population can be in. It can be naive, is the word we use for saying that disease is not there. Um, it can be experiencing an epizootic, wherein the disease, is, that's sort of the animal word for epidemic, where there's a small outbreak of the disease, and that's when that particular lake is seeing a lot of dying frogs. And from there, two things can happen. Um, it can go to being extirpated or locally extinct where no frogs are left and the disease has killed all of them in a relatively short amount of time. Over a longer time scale, if some of those frogs do survive, it may transition into a state that we're calling persistent or that's where the frogs are living and resisting the disease somehow. And that's something we're certainly still studying is how they do that and how that transition occurs. Um, it, it takes a while for that to happen, but there are, there are two options, basically, once an epizootic occurs. And for the most part, in Yosemite, it looks like a lot of frog populations have actually transitioned to being persistent there. And the same even north of Yosemite around Tahoe. Um, and so we have a lot of options to study frogs that have the disease and just sort of live with it. Um, 
much like we maybe live with seasonal flu or something, you know, it comes and goes and we get sick and then we get better. And some of us, you know, a few people, not to be callous, but, you know, some people die from flu every year, but many make it. And, and that's sort of how BD goes through these persistent populations. Whereas in the extirpated populations, there are basically no frogs, if any, left. <clears throat> so although they're not, these frogs are listed under the California and the US Endangered Species Acts. So how do we restore them amid this panzoatic? You know, how can we take this thing that's such a threat and get past it? Well, re recovering any species um, and, and indeed repairing anything requires relieving it from the thing that's causing it to decline or fall apart or be under stress. Um, so we need relief from that stressor. And there's sort of two approaches I can imagine taking to this. You can one, eliminate the stressor, right? You know, if, if, if your bruise hurts, stop poking it and it'll feel better. Um, or you can help the frog withstand the stressor. You know, keep poking your bruise, but um, buck up and learn to live with it. Um, anyway, <laughs> we can remove fish and we can remove that stressor. And that's actually something that CDFW and the Park Service does in lakes where they've identified as being high quality frog habitat that they want to restore and provide opportunities for frogs and other animals to come back in. And they can eradicate fish from those lakes through mechanical means by catching them all. Um, and, and so that stressor can be removed. Removing BD from a, from a lake or a stream is, is not possible, at least given our current uh, technology and, and logistics. Um, it's been tried in small ponds in Europe. And um, it, you know, they kept it out for a while, but as animals moved back in, they basically had to drain the ponds. So as the animals moved back in, eventually BD came with them. Um, <clears throat> given that a lot of our sites are in wilderness and also very remote, draining ponds is not an option, nor do I think we really want to do it. There are a lot of animals that depend on those ponds. So how we remove BD from those habitats still remains a mystery. But maybe we can help the frogs actually withstand the stressor better. Maybe we can help them be stronger in some way. And, and actually build up some BD resistance. And that's where a lot of our conservation action has um, focused. Everything I'll talk about from here, having said that removing fish from a lake um, can be very successful. Um, everything I talk about here will occur in a fishless lake that either was historically fishless or where fish have been removed successfully um, and frog habitat has been restored. So. Okay, there's sort of four things we can do here, and I see this sort of as a, a progression. We can help the frogs survive the epizootic. We can merely help them get through that initial stress, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll do the work on the other end. Um, we can try to give them disease resistance and actually help them fight off the disease. As I mentioned, there are some frogs, especially in Yosemite, that live, that persist with the disease, so we can exploit that naturally occurring disease resistance. And maybe we can also help frogs adapt and evolve on their own and evolve some of that resistance that their neighbors have. Um, and that's sort of a union of the, the middle two categories maybe. So I'm gonna talk about these all in a bit more depth now. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of insight into what we do, a lot of our work before I jump into that, because I'll talk about evaluating the success of all those things. In order to evaluate what a frog population is doing, we have to engage in a lot of long-term monitoring. As I mentioned, these tadpoles grow slowly, and then it takes a couple of years for them to turn into reproducing adults. So you might imagine that it takes a long time to actually see positive growth in a frog population. And that is in fact true. It's the slightly painful thing about working with these animals. You can't do a you know, one month or three month experiment in a cage. You have to wait years for something to happen in a lake. Um, it's a bit different than some of the other types of ecology that we engage in. <clears throat> but basically to evaluate what's happening in a frog population, we walk around lakes 
where frogs may or may not be, and we do a visual count. If there are frogs there, to a large extent these days, we're actually putting an RFE ID tag in as many of those individual frogs as possible so that we can identify them. And by identifying them, we can track their health and their survival through time um, and hopefully through many years. This is what's called the capture mark recapture survey where we catch the cough frog, we put the tag in it and we release it and then hopefully recapture it and we can get information over time on how many times we catch each individual and build up a data set there um, that we can make statistical models of. And these statistical models can allow us to estimate the abundance of the, pop the size of the population, um, how much the frogs are surviving, how, what the proportion of surviving frogs is, as well as how many frogs are entering the population, um, which we use the term recruitment to say they're coming into the population, and that could be either migration or reproduction. <clears throat> when we do catch a frog, because we're interested in disease, we do something that um, these days a lot of folks are a little more familiar with because of COVID testing. So you may have gotten a nasal swab. Um, we don't do that to frogs, but we do rub their bellies with a Q-tip like thing. And then we use the PCR process that's very similar to what they're using for COVID testing to measure the amount of BV on the frog. And we use the term load to describe how much BV is on an individual frog. And that's basically a measure of how many fungal spores are on the skin of the frog. So um, you can see that down here, this little Q-tippy thing rubbing the drink patch of the frog, which is their wettest part and is often touching the substrate. So, <clears throat> um, and this is a guy just walking around the lake hoping he'll see a frog. Okay, with all that, all those tools under our belt, we can head out and look for frog populations that need our, that we can help um, get through these BV outbreaks. Um, our first, our first goal is to help frogs survive the epizootic. Um, basically, if we can buy them time, their immune response actually can help them get through um, that outbreak. As we see in this figure down here, um, we have frogs that were treated with a drug and frogs that weren't. Um, in the second panel, we recaught only on the second date uh, frogs that had been tre treated. And then a little while later, um, we saw frogs that actually um, we caught all those, um, sorry, we caught a number of those frogs again. And we can see that BD load, or the number of fungal spores on the frog, has actually gone down. Um, this is a little bit of a confusing result. Um, but after treating them with the antifungal drug, um, we reduced the number of fungal spores on them. And hopefully this gives them time for their immune response to ramp up and actually help them survive. Um, so they get a bath in this antifungal drug um, over a series of days. We catch a lot of frogs and, and in the lakes and, and put them through this rigorous procedure. Um, the results have varied at the population level. We've had really good results in one lake, at least. Um, we got frogs through the epizootic and they survived for several years until there was a really big winter and that may have then pushed them over the edge, um, but they're not doing well at this point. And at other populations, they have not done well after this procedure, but um, it's a really tricky thing to do. We have to, much like with COVID, and we saw you know, rapidly increasing infection rates in our population, if we get there when too many individuals are sick and when they're too sick, we actually can't save them. Um, we won't be able to reduce the loads enough that the frogs will survive. <clears throat> um, and, and there may have already been too much mortality um, for them to, to have enough frogs going through the next, to the next year. This is still very much an experimental procedure that we're trying to refine, um, but it's promising enough that we've formed an interagency rapid response team that can actually respond if we detect a BV outbreak. Um, we'll, we'll take a bunch of people into the back country and, and try to do one of these treatments on hundreds of frogs if we can. Um, we're also involved in Head Start programs at the zoo. And this is a way to give frogs some disease resistance 
So as I mentioned, frogs can mount an immune response to BD. Um, so exposing them to the disease can trigger their immune response. We can then use that same drug to absolutely clear them of their infection. And this is happening in the zoo, so it's all very controlled. This is where the Oakland and San Francisco zoos come in. Um, and we can also collect a lot of tadpoles. The zoos can, can handle a lot of individual frogs and they can keep them really healthy and help them survive. And so we actually, um, through these Head Start programs, we can take huge numbers of tadpoles to the zoo. Almost all those tadpoles are gonna to survive to adulthood. The zoos are gonna fatten them up and they're gonna be really healthy when they go back in the field. And I think Carol can attest to some of the frogs they helped us release this summer being just really chunky. Um, and, and that helps them survive. So um, we can collect them, expose them to the fungus, treat them with the drugs, maximize their growth for a couple of weeks in the zoo, and then let them go. Um, results here have been a little bit context dependent and varied by site as well. Where frogs are persistent or come from a persistent population, if we do this procedure with them, um, survival tends to be pretty good. Um, we've had more mixed results where they come from a naive zoo, we can't, or from a naive population, we, we can get them sick and we can treat them, um, but they don't seem to survive as long in the wild. And so there may some, be something inherently different about those frogs that we're not aware of yet. Um, so there's a lot of potential for this, but it's challenging. That procedure of getting sick and then getting treated is really stressful for the frogs. So if we can find a way around that, we will attempt to. Um, but we can see here, Ashley is collecting some tadpoles and we put them in these coolers and they get flown or hiked out. Um, and here, Colleen, who works for Yosemite, is releasing a little frog about to jump into this pollen here. So that's the two ends of this process. Um, this is almost the easiest and most successful thing that we've done so far is just direct translocations of frogs where we find frogs that are persisting at site A and theoretically, if they persist at site A, they should persist at site B, and that turns out to largely be true. Translocation is, in its essence, a simple task of just putting a frog in a container and moving it um, over very short distances. That is true that it's simple. Over longer distance, we have to get helicopters involved so that the frogs don't overheat and or we don't fall walking over some of this granity stuff. Um, but you can see this is one of these enormous frogs that comes out of the zoo. And that's because we actually have taken to putting the head starting program in the midst of this process. Even if we're just trying to move frogs you know, over the hill, it helps them so much to go through the zoo and get big and fat and healthy and have high survival rates um, that we try to do this. Our results with this are excellent and we're up to doing about three to five sites per year across the various parks and jurisdictions that we work in. So um, it is currently our best tool. Um, something that we're very excited about starting that we started last summer and we're working on refining new projects for this is what we're calling targeted gene flows. So this is helping frogs adapt resistance. Basically, the idea that some of these frogs are already resistant, then they probably have a gene for that resistance. And we know that there are populations that are very likely naive and will be, be, will be driven extinct when the, when the um, fungus shows up there. So we're actually trying to take those resistant frogs, introduce them into these naive populations, hope that they breed, and hope the offspring have those resistant genes, and that those genes will um, integress into the population and provide a population level resistance to BD when it does arrive. Um, theoretically, there's a lot of potential here. Results are TBD. We've just started these projects. Um, there are some limits in terms of we can't move frogs that are genetically different apart from, you know, that are occupy really different areas of the Sierra. There is real genetic differences there and we don't want to mix those up too much. Um, and we also need to be careful about the populations we're taking frogs from. We can't take too many frogs out of those. So we're a little bit limited there as well. Sorry about that. But we're really excited about this opportunity. So there's a lot of big questions remaining and things we have to do. Um, questions about why are there these different traits for different populations? Why do some go extinct and some do not? 
Uh, why do some persist? Is it host pathogen or path, or is it host or pathogen genetics, or is it the environment? And some of our collaborators, um, Sherry Briggs and Erica, or sorry, Bree Rosenblum at Berkeley, are helping us with that. Um, can we improve the success of our restoration and get more frogs to recruit and make it? And can these conservation genetic tools help frogs manage disease on their own? Ultimately, that would be great. We didn't have to be involved, and they were just living with this disease um, on their own. Um, so challenges remain. Frogs grow slowly, so it makes these studies take a long time. Um, but there is hope. Um, this figure here shows time on the x-axis and the mean count of surveys done in Yosemite Park by ourselves, USGS, the, the Park Service, um, all sort of mashed together. And if there's one notable thing about here, whoops, I'm sorry, this line is going up. And that indicates that there's recovery in Yosemite and frogs are recovering across the landscape in that region. And this is probably happening in the Northern Sierra as well, um, where similar management actions have been happening. This is largely the result of fish eradication um, and those frogs being BV persistent. And so they're able to occupy new spaces safely. So um, yeah, and this recovery is, it's unparalleled in the, in the context of BV and uh, we're hoping to see more of it. So um, with that, I will hopefully use any time I have to take questions. Sorry for going a little bit long there. So thanks. Excellent. Great. Thank you. That's, that's so exciting. Thank you for your talk. We have a, a couple, we have a bunch of questions actually. So I'm going to just launch right into it. Um, uh, and, and not before I start by saying that just imagining frogs on a helicopter coming from Oakland and landing in Mammoth is probably one of the coolest things I've thought about today. So thanks. Thanks for that. Um, all right. Our first question is from uh, Eric uh, Warkentine. Um, and Eric asks, how does BD move from lake to lake or stream to stre stream to stream? Is there a vector? That, that is the $10 million, $20 million, $30 million question. Um, no one has yet really gotten their hands on that thing that moves BD around, whether it's moving on a different animal, a bird or an insect, um, mm -hmm. or a different frog. There are other frogs, specific chorus frogs that move between these habitats. Um, but mountain yellow frogs themselves are not moving between basins and across the broad landscape that much. They'll move a couple hundred meters, but they're not going across rocky ridges. So it's probably something a little more mobile. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is widespread already. We do find it in places even before we detect big outbreaks and, and notice disease in frogs, we do find low levels of it. So um, that's a very good question. It hasn't been answered in Australia, Central America, Europe. Um, it's all still, we're still wondering. So here, a good here, question. Here's, here's another question from, from Eric Warkentine, kind of related and asking, can, can tadpoles be affected or is this disease only for adult frogs? Well, actually that's a really interesting question and has important implications because yes, tadpoles can be infected, but they don't typically um, show disease or have any sort of sickness or death associated with being infected. And they can actually be really, really infected and have lots of fungal spores living on them. Um, and that may be one of the reasons that it's able, that BD is able to kill all the adults in the population is because they can keep getting infected from the tadpoles. Um, and, and so, you know, people say, well, how can a disease kill all of its hosts? Then it kills itself out. Well, it's not really killing all of, you know, it's killing all the adults and it's still living on tadpoles and then those tadpoles die when they metamorphose. Okay, so here's, here's some questions about the environment. Um, Barry McPherson asks, UD, UV radiation from ozone depletion was considered a factor in high altitude reptile declines at one time. Has that been ruled out now? Um, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm not 100% sure on what the, the consensus on that these days is. Um, and I would guess that the answer is it depends, because that's what ecologists say when they don't know. <laughs> so um, hope, yeah, I, I really don't know the answer to that, whether it's been ruled out or whether it's still 
seen as a threat in some areas and not others. It's certainly, if it's playing a role for some species, it, it's probably dwarfed by the effect that diseases like BD are having on amphibians as a group. So. Okay, this question um, comes from Alistair Dobson. Alistair asks, how long will BD persist in ponds where frog populations have been extirpated? How do you test whether BD is present in an environment without frogs? Well, I don't think we know the answer to the first part of that question. And, and I just wanna comment that for these complicated multi-part questions, having the chat here in Zoom is really helpful. We don't usually get that in seminars when people ask long, complicated questions. So I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, so how long will BD persist in ponds where frog populations have been extirpated? Um, we don't know, but it's a while because we've often put frogs back into places long after, well, when frog, so sorry, let me back up and make sure I say this correctly. Um, for lakes where there were no frogs and we didn't know why there were no frogs, we have tried to put frogs back into those lakes. And in many cases, they have gotten BD fairly quickly. Um, which suggests that BD is in the lake even when we don't see frogs there. Now that might be that there is a different amphibian living there and that's helping maintain BD. It might be that BD is living in the mud. So various fungi have lots of complex life cycles where they can live on other things. Um, it may be eating stuff in the mud when it's not eating frog skin. Um, and, and, you know, at least within our, the context of our work, I think we've seen it, you know, within 10 years, but it could be much longer. Mm -hmm. um, certainly lakes where we don't even have a record of BD, of there being frogs or BD. Um, and if we don't have a record of frogs being there, that means frogs have been absent for a fairly long time because we've been surveying there and other people have been surveying so many lakes in this era for a very long time. So that suggests it can persist for a while or that it can get back in from somewhere else quite quickly. So, so here's a question um, from Colin Thayer. I apologize if I'm uh, chopping up your name. Um, Colin yeah, asks, what is- I know Colin. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so Colin's asking, uh, what's, what is the typical lifespan of a healthy frog? Are, are many frogs bred at the zoo or are they mostly taken from the wild as tadpoles? Yeah, so that's a good question. I'm gonna embarrass Colin first by saying that Colin worked for me in the field and at UCSB around 2012. Um, so it's good to see folks um, that we know staying connected. Thanks, Colin. Um, so the typical lifespan of a healthy pro frog um, is probably, let's say five to 10 years. Um, some can live quite a bit longer than that. Um, keep in mind that if you're, a tadpole and you're in a very cold lake at very high elevation, you're probably not even turning into a frog until you're three years old. And then that frog is not even capable of breathing, breeding until it's four or five years old. Um, so for a frog to be a successful member of its population and contributing to population growth and stuff, it's probably got to be about five years old. And, and hopefully they're living a little bit longer than that to, to keep the population going. Um, Many frogs being bred at the zoo, in, in a grand scale, no, basically, but you know, uh, for the, the resources we have, it feels like a lot of frogs are being bred at the zoo. Um, it's, it's anywhere from you know, maybe a couple hundred to a few hundred amongst the two different zoo zoos. Um, and then I've forgotten the last part of Colin's question and it just disappeared on me. So, um, uh He's asking, well, he, he's asking, um, are they mostly taken from the wild as tadpoles? Yes, so um, that's, our, that's our goal because it's easy to transport a lot of tadpoles. Um, and then uh, they metamorphose at the zoo and then we take them back as adult frogs. Um, but it's really easy to catch, you know, a hundred tadpoles here or there and, and pretty easy to put them in a couple buckets and put that on the helicopter. It's much, much easier to do that than trying to pack adult frogs out and it's much less stressful on them, I think. Um, but it does mean that they end up being a lot smaller when we go to release them because they started as tadpoles. 
-hmm. And that certainly makes them susceptible to things like predation from snakes or birds, because they're just little bite-sized morsels. So. Okay, so here's our, our last question. We, we have more questions. I'm sorry, we're not gonna have time to um, uh, get to them. Uh, so here we go. Um, this is a question from uh, Bradley Colgate. And Bradley asks, is there a research that suggests that fish can be carriers of BD, seeing as that seeing as they prey on frogs infected with BD? Can it be uh, uh, trans transmitted through predation? Yeah, so I'm not aware of um, I'm not aware of research that has shown that. Um, there are other organisms that will carry BD. Um, we don't know if it breeds on those other organisms as it does on frogs. So as I mentioned, this is the only chytrid fungus that we're aware of that infects vertebrates, although I should mention that there is also a, a European spinoff to BD called B. sal, which more infects salamanders rather than frogs. BD is more frog specific. B. sal is more salamander specific. Um, so I don't know that there's much supporting that it would grow on a fish, whether a fish could carry it because it carries water um, or it's in the water, it's wet. Um, and and the, the fungus will live in wet stuff. Um, I, I don't know that there's any indication of whether, you know, as fish were stocked into the Sierra, were they carrying BD with them? Um, we certainly don't know that. Um, and is that, is that the whole question? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the whole question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom, very much. I, I really appreciate it. It sounds like we need to get you up into those mountains more often so you can start solving all these, all these questions that everybody has. And um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for a, a really exciting talk. And, you know, it's really great to hear about the kind of blend of science and, and conservation and, and all the work that you and your team and, and everybody out there is doing on this. This is really special and, and thank you for sharing this with us tonight. Um, for next week, I just wanted to um, uh, tell you all about a little bit about this, our, our speaker for next week. This is the last, um, our grand finale, and uh, this will be hosted by the Valentine Camp Reserve. And we will have two speakers, Dr. Hugh Safford of UC Davis and Ashley Gruppenhoff, who's a PhD doctoral student in, in his lab there. And they will be speaking about fuels management and forest restoration in the Sierra Nevada, the case for active forest management on the Valentine Reserve. So come here about, about our forests and, and uh, how to manage them in this, in this new era. Um, thank you, everybody. I just wanted to, again, um, say how much we appreciate you taking your time and, and, and joining us tonight. And we hope to see you next week. So thank you, Tom, and thank you, Carol, and everybody have a, have a great evening.